Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Mentor Monday interview series at the Stony Brook University Music Department. My name is Charles Schur, and I'm a first year PhD student in the music history, theory, and ethnomusicology area in the department. I'm an East Asian man in his mid 20s with short black hair and dark print glasses, and I'm wearing a black dress shirt with a striped tie with sky blue, dark blue, and yellow colors. In my background, there is a white bookshelf a lamp with a white lampshade, a window with blinds that are stowed, and a white wall, and the door with a green bulletin board. And today I have the pleasure and honor of interviewing one of the professors in, in the department, Professor Judy Lockett. Hi, Judy. Hello, Charles. Why don't we first start off um, by, by having you give a brief introduction and, and the description of yourself? Great. So my name is Judy Lockett. Uh, Judith, formally, is my name. I am a professor of music theory and history in the Department of Music. I'm also an associate dean in the College of Arts and Sciences. Um, I am a, a white woman uh, and I'm over 65 years old and I have uh, hair that's kind of medium length, though you can't really see it. It's mainly kind of mix of, of brown and, and gray, right? Uh, I do wear eyeglasses. Uh, and I'm wearing headphones because it's the easiest way to do Zoom these days. And I, um, I'm i wearing a, a dark kind of comfy jacket and the background in my room here is a kind of light blue with a plant and a picture. And the plant is a what's known as a Christmas cactus. And we'll get back to that later about, about the plant. So it's to my understanding that at one point in, in your tenure here at Sony Brook, that you were in fact the department chair of the Department of Music. Um, would you like to tell, 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 tell the audience how, how, how that tenure went and, and what, what are some moments that you're proud of? Right. So I was chair of the Department of Music from around 2001 to 2006. And then again from 2009 to 2012. So I served as chair for a total of, of nine years. Um, the, the very beginning of my tenure as chair was marked by 9-11 and it was very momentous time uh, in the department then. And so I always remember the, like the first, some of the first events that, that happened. Um, over the course of the, um, my tenure as chair, we went through a lot of staff changes. And it was during that time that we actually hired Martha Zadok, which was a, a kind of wonderful um, event in the department. She's been with the department ever since. Um, and then we hired several other, other staff members. Um, some of the things that we were trying to do during that time was to codify requirements and uh, and sort of solidify what we had just then um, introduced the ethnomusicology program. So we were trying to solidify that into the curriculum, uh, and we did we did a lot of other hires in the performance um, track as well. So. So I think it was it was you know kind of business as usual. There were no huge changes, but it did see uh, a number of challenges that had to do uh, in the second my last term that had to do with the the recession that started in two thousand eight, and there were lots of cutbacks, and we had to to deal with things. But we've come through pretty well over the years, and uh, and it was a great pleasure to to work with all of the faculty in the department during those years. I see. Um, so so what academic projects are you currently working on? Are you working on a book? Do you have an upcoming book publication that you'd like to promote? Sure. So most uh, imminently is a book that's going to be published by University of Chicago Press uh, called Sound and Affect. And it was it is co-edited by me and my colleague Stephen Smith and another colleague in Eduardo Mendieta, who was on the philosophy faculty uh, a, a few years ago when we got this project going. He's now a professor at um, Penn State University. Uh, the, the book is a collection of essays on that topic, on the topic of sound and affect, and it includes authors who are musicologists, 
ethnomusicologists and philosophers. Uh, so it's a kind of diverse uh, collection of authors who are presented there. Um, so that should be coming out within in April sometime. Not sure. We're waiting for the book to come. So, so that was a, a great project that we worked on. It was great to work with those colleagues. Um, I'm currently, uh, I'll soon have an article published in the Oxford Handbook on Spectralism on the music of Kaya Sariaho. And I'm also working on an article about, um, it's going to be in a queer music theories book and it's going to take up the question of, of what I call situational multiplicities. So you position yourself as an analyst. And for that, I'm analyzing the music of Kaya Chernowin, um, her uh, Enea Crystal. And then pretty soon, I'm going to be working on another book that's, I mean, another article is called Tambor's Realities that will appear in, in a Oxford handbook on phenomenology and music. Uh, that will be done pretty soon in June or so. Sometime in, in I think it's going to be October now, I'm going to be going to the Zacher Institute in Switzerland and be looking at the, uh, the uh, archives of Sofia Gubadulino for a new article that's going to be coming out. So got a lot of projects in the work. I see. Um, now switching gears from, from the research into the classroom. Um, so, so at your time at Stony Brook, um, and, and you've, kept, you've most certainly taught a multitude of, a multitude of classes here in the department. Um, how have you promoted diversity and inclusion in your classes? Right. So I can answer this in a couple of different ways. One, it, in terms of the graduate courses that I teach, I always include uh, music by women and by diverse composers, either, either people who are of Asian extraction or from um, African-American uh, men. Uh, so I try to, to address the music of those diverse composers. And I also try to incorporate different kinds of methodologies by which people can demonstrate their, uh, their abilities to learn and understand. I will also say that I've developed several courses for undergraduates, for undergraduate non-majors that, that put, uh, that kind of show how music of the African dis diaspora and music of, of the European uh, tradition uh, interact with one another over the, you know, in interesting ways during particular time periods. So I did that with a course on American music um, and I haven't taught that one for a while, but it, it looked at all these diverse kinds of music that are, have been uh, created and performed in, in North America. And then uh, I also teach a course on music and culture of the 1960s that does a similar kind of thing, but from a much kind of smaller, um, shorter time period. So the diversity there is, is kind of built into the, the music that, you, that one teaches. So, in the music and culture of the 60s, we talk about the music of Elliot Carter. At the same time, we talk about the music of, of Ornette Coleman uh, and, and uh, um, Nina Simone and, uh, and, and Outkast. And <laughs> so it's really looking at a broad array of music and thinking about them as, as, a, as a consequence of the, cultural, the culture that they come out of. You mentioned a book that you that that is that is forthcoming um that, mm -hmm. that deals with music and philosophy and 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 many of us colleagues here in the department may have also take, taken a class of yours that that was if something within the field of philosophy and um and 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 music um for example mm -hmm. I took your I, I took your music analysis and new materialism class last semester so how do you seamlessly join music with other academic fields, um, such as philosophy or, or ethnomusicology in a teaching? Mm -hmm. So the, the, it's a question of how seamless it is, but it, there's certainly the attempt to, to read broadly, to get ideas uh, from other fields that can help us find ways to understand music. So music is, a, in some ways, a 
kind of an enigma because it's sound and 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 it's wonderful because it's sound, right? Um, but because of that, it also uh, poses some challenges to the way we understand what the music is and how we can go about it. So I've always found that reaching out to some of the other fields and in particular phenomenological philosophy was was really useful for me because it provides a, a method and a, a mode of addressing a musical experience. So uh, I've tried to bring in readings from those various fields and I interact with people in the philosophy department and but you know the, the the challenge of that is trying to take some oftentimes very complicated thoughts and then to apply them to music as a way to to understand the music. So that that's that's what I that's the method behind what I've done is that I felt that I needed some other tools to look at at contemporary musics. As as many of the people in the audience may or may not know. I'm you have been teaching at Stony Brook University for, for, for quite a while now, and you've yes. also been conducting academic research for quite a while now. At what point in your life did you realize that you wanted to, to, per, per, you wanted to pursue music academia as something that you would do for the rest of your life? Right, so this actually goes back to when I was an undergrad. I did my undergrad major in music at UCLA, and I started as a performance major, and I started taking a music analysis classes and music theory classes and and it was really engaging to me to to do that and so and I had some really inspiring teachers when I was an undergraduate and at that point it was like well hey maybe I'll go to graduate school <laughs> and went to graduate school and enjoyed it and just kind of continued on doing it so I think it was probably a moment in my senior year as an undergrad when it became clear that this would be an interesting path for me to take. And what did you do at graduate school? What did I do at graduate school? No, where did you do your graduate Oh, I actually graduate. did my graduate work at Stony Brook. Ah, I, so, so you've been here much longer than-, than Yes, you. yes, I did. And all the people that I worked with uh, are, had kind of left by the, most of the people had left by the time I started as a faculty member. Um, but I came and I wanted to work with David Lewin and Leo Treitler. And by the, I also got to work with some other faculty who were, were here at the time, but those were the primary people that I was interested in. And Stony Brook, even back in the day, had a, had a reputation for emphasizing recent music. And that was my specialty. And so I wanted to do it. Well, certainly. Um, so, so what instrument did you play during your undergraduate career? You, you mentioned you, you, you started out as a performance yeah, major. That's right. I was a clarinetist and I still sort of play sometimes. So, um, and I took it very seriously, you know, the, the work that I was doing uh, with performance. And even while I was a graduate student, I uh, did play recitals and was active in, in music performance while I was a graduate student. Now, now looking back, is, is there another musical instrument that you wish you knew how to play or, or is there something that you want to learn still? Well, I used to, when I was in high school, I used to play saxophone and I'd like to get back to playing saxophone. And I always wished I could be better at the keyboard. Ah, <laughs> don't we all wish we were better? Yes. <laughs> um, what, what, what do you do in your free time? When we're not doing research and, and, when, when, and, and, and we're not doing teaching them. Um, Right. What was that? that is it that, that you do? Well, I, I do have a very uh, serious garden and uh, I grow vegetables and flowers and other things, I enjoy the backyard. Um, and I like to bicycle. I like to actually bicycle to work when I can. And I like to go hiking. And usually every year we've gone to one of the national parks in the United States and gone hiking in one of those, those uh, parks. We didn't do it last year, obviously. Um, and then finally, I like to go to concerts. Ah, and, 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 and so, so how have you been faring with, with concert attendance this year with the pandemic? Yeah, not, not too good. <laughs> I've tried to do some streaming and I've, I've listened to some, but, but it's just not quite the same thing. Ah. So. So, I mean, I listen to music all the time, but I like the experience of going and, and being in a live situation. The acoustics are better um, and you get more of a sense of connection with, with the performers.
And and so one last question: Would you like to describe the house plan you have done? You mentioned of the cactus or something. Right. So this up here is a Christmas cactus that really likes this window that it's in, and it has grown so big it's become this gigantic thing. Uh, it's not blooming now, but it has a, a magnificent period where it blooms in November, and it's it's just kind of I don't know what's I'll never be able to move it because it's too big. <laughs> so. I see. Well, well, thank you very much for taking the time to, to do this interview with me. And, and, and thank you all in the audience for, for, for tuning in to this episode of Mentor Monday um, with the Department of Music at Swinburne University. Until next time. <laughs>